Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is John Bond, Lead Sales and Marketing at Medmont. Medmont is a leader, leading provider of specialty care eye market. We at Medmont are extremely excited for today's presentation. That is because today we are presenting our new addition to our product portfolio. Randy is a Clinical Research and Development Director for Precision Technology based in Vancouver, Canada. He also serves as a research scientist and clinical instructor at Pacific University College of Optometry in Forest Grove, Oregon. Additionally, he is our clinical advisor at MedMont. Randy has published numerous articles and submitted posters on various contact lens related topics, as well as been a contributing author in a number of textbook chapters. He lectures globally and has a passion of sharing his insights methods, and research with eye care colleagues from around the world. Randy is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, the British Contact Lens Association, the Scalero Lens Education Society, and the Internal Academy of Ortho-K. With no further ado, Randy, take it away. Hey, thanks, John. Much appreciated. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome. Thanks uh, to all of you for logging in. I know we've got folks from across the Pacific and across the Atlantic and continents near and far. So thank you for uh, joining us today. As John mentioned, we're going to introduce the new Medmont Meridia Advanced Topographer. Um, I've been lucky enough to have one at the university for must be almost a year now. And we've been able to uh, play with it and run it through uh, a bunch of different uh, tests and cases and so uh, I hope to share with you some of our findings with the instrument and give you some perspective on on how we might use this in practice. Today's session will be mostly fundamental and we'll just try to cover the topography basics for those of us on the session that are relatively new to corneal topography. Then in the second session that John was explaining, um, we'll go through more advanced topics and then the final will focus very much on uh, dry eye disease with Steph Wu. But um, the goal today is to give you an introduction both to the fundamentals of usage, but also what you can do with this brand new instrument. Now, all of you, or many of you, I'm sorry, may have a MedMont topographer and you're familiar with it being a tool for taking topography, but what MedMont has done is added a whole bunch of new features to the instrument that really makes it a awesomely powerful tool. You could say that it's a topographer that does imaging uh, options, but really what it does is it's a very precise instrument that allows for multimodal functionality in, in that you can do many different things with this instrument. Placing the patient behind this one instrument allows you to do many things and it allows you as the practitioner to have access to so much information and again, very precise information. You're probably familiar with the MedMont topographer being accurate. But now with the MedMont Meridia, you have a device that takes very high resolution images of the entire anterior segment. So a very exciting uh, option that um, I'm very uh, keen to share with you today. Now, those of you who have had a MedMont, you know that it's a 32 ring placido topographer. It stretches those rings to the far periphery of the cornea, and that's one of the advantages of a small cone instrument. You're able to shorten the focal distance and push that ring reflection to the far periphery of the cornea. In other words, we get a large surface area of capture. That's one of the benefits. And if those data points are accurately interpreted, then we get a very accurate topography. And I think that's something that the MedMon is very well known for in many, many studies. Now with the MedMon, we do get that very large surface area of capture, generally around 11 millimeters, but sometimes we have some pretty large corneas. Sometimes we have lid and eyelash shadows in the way. And how does a topographer get around those kind of limitations to the measurement to the far periphery? 
And MedMod has this very ingenious method that they created to give us more information than what we might get from one single topography capture. In this case, you can see we've, we've got this very large understanding of the topography of this cornea, but we are missing a little bit of 12 o'clock, of three o'clock, the temporal side, and a little bit of six o'clock. And that's mostly to do with anatomy, not the instrument itself. But to get around that, what MedMon allows us to do is something called the composite eye capture. And that has us change fixation from the center to looking temporal, to looking nasal, to looking down, to looking up, stretching those rings and those data points all over the periphery. So we have this very uh, complete view. Each one of those images is converted to a topography and then they can be merged together to create a complete understanding of the corneal shape, power, and elevation. Now, how big an area can you get? Um, the largest that I've taken is about 13 millimeters. Uh, it is supposed to work on a horse eye up to about 14 or 15 millimeters. So you should be able to get a, um, a large enough area for most of our, our contact lenses. And this is, of course, really important because what is the diameter of our specialty lenses today? I mean, our, our ortho K lenses are a small lens is 10.6, a normal diameter maybe 10.8 or 11 millimeters. Our scleral lenses are 16, 17 millimeters. So we want as much corneal data as we can to give us the best possible starting point, especially related to our rigid contact lens um, fits. Now, you might ask if you do have a Medmont E300 corneal topographer that you've had for, uh, for any um, amount of time that you've known it's a very accurate instrument and it does a very good job of its contact lenses. So how about this new Meridia? Is it going to be as accurate as the E300 was? And, and our team at Pacific uh, did a small pilot study on this on 30 eyes and we looked at the apical radius of the cornea, the, the steep and flat meridians. We looked at the height, thinking of the eye like a mountain, how high is the mountain, eccentricity, and the K readings. And how do the two instruments compare? And basically it works out to the uh, cone is identical between the two instruments. So therefore the understanding of eye shape is similarly the same. For instance, in the radius of the center of the cornea, the instruments are separated by a sixteenth of a diopter, so basically a quarter of a quarter of a diopter. The uh, sagittal height differential was a micron. The um, flat and steep K readings were basically a uh, fifth of a quarter of a diopter. So we're talking about uh, basically the two instruments are the same in the way they measure which is important because the E300 is relied upon in many educational sites, in many clinics to be the tool to build that first ortho K lens, that first rigid contact lens fit to achieve a very high first fit success. So it would be nice to have the confidence um, to know that the new Meridia is gonna do the same kind of quality of capture. And, and that's the story, it does. It is the same as the E300 in terms of its uh, accuracy for capture. Now let's take a case. And it's always fun to go through a particular uh, patient file. And, and here's one where we've got the topography and, and how might we begin with the analysis? And of course, I think we're all so comfortable with K readings. We all want to kind of start there. And here we see an eye that has two diopters of corneal astigmatism. We look at the eccentricity. Of course, that's the rate of corneal flattening of the eye. It gives you an idea of the, the height of the eye. And here we see the cornea has an absolutely normal 0.65 eccentricity. The disease detection indices are green for the first, yellow for the next two, saying that uh, two of the indices are saying the eye is suspect, it's yellow in the disease detection analysis. Why is that? Well, we might look at the topography. Do you notice anything funny about this 
uh, anterior surface shape using an axial interpretation. Now clearly we see a with the rule cornea. We have our hot meridian running vertically, so steep axis running vertical with the rule cornea. But notice across the flat there's this channel or this hole through the center um, that is kind of odd. You might look at this, these hotter contours and they kind of form these bumps in them. And we know that corneas are really smooth. Should the eye have these kind of sharp angles or these bumps in the surface? That kind of makes you suspect that something isn't quite right. Well, let's go from an axial interpretation, which is power or vision. Let's go to the tangential. And do you see anything funny here when you look at this topography? Is there anything that pops up on this kind of normal with the rule cornea? And one thing you might look at is that ring, these two arcs that appear in the corneal shape, uh, these flat spots, and that's where your rigid contact lens is landing down and molding the eye shape. So the tangential is very sensitive to areas where we mold. And you might look down on the graph. What sticks out at you on that graph? And you might pick out those two points. That's where the contact lens is digging into the eye surface. So basically, we have a patient that has a rigid, uh, that is a rigid contact lens where it's fitting a little flat. It's flattening the central cornea out, and that's why we saw that that hole across the center of the axial topography. In the tangential, we see the ring of landing of our lens. Um, and we can tell that our, our contact lens might be a little bit loose for this eye, hitting the corneal apex, riding a little bit high, creating a bit of a, a junction in the surface of the, the cornea. Well, why is it riding high? Now, we might go to the elevation map and try to have an understanding of, of what we see here. And in the elevation map, you know that red is where the elevation of the eye is high. That's where a contact lens is going to bear the hardest. Blue is where the contact lens is going to lift or where, excuse me, where the corneal elevation drops. And you notice at 12 o'clock, we have minus 25 microns elevation. In other words, the corneal elevation is much lower by 25 microns than most of the rest. Then heading towards six o'clock, it drops by 50 microns. So our with the rule cornea is much steeper in this meridian, and we've got that drop in elevation allows the contact lens to rock back and forth. So we might require a toric lens for this eye. That might be why the previous lens wanted to fit a little bit toward the flat side, riding a little bit high. This is where we use the Medmont contact lens software, and this is a tool that allows you to take your highly accurate map and then place a rigid contact lens on top of that topography. Optimize the fit, optimize the diameter, the apical clearance, the landing, the edge lift, everything about the lens so that we place the right first lens on the patient the first time, making us more efficient in practice. So how do you do this? Well, the first step is measure visible iris diameter. And now for those of you who've had a Medmon E300, you'll notice that you now have a color image to, um, to assess the uh, borders of the visible iris, but you'll also notice a wild, a wild, a wider field of view. And this is without zooming out the, the actual image. The topography image is now incredibly large. You could image over top of a scleral lens and be able to see the entire lens, even if it's uh, as large as 17 millimeters. But I digress. Let's go back to fitting our GP lens. Let's measure visible iris diameter. It's pretty normal, 11.7. So we'll select our initial lens diameter. For us at the university, we tend to like larger lenses, so VID minus 1.3 millimeters might be a starting point, so a 10.4 millimeter lens for this eye. Then what we want to do is fit our base curve to create the appropriate apical clearance. And that's about 20 to 25 microns, gives you the lens that's just the right amount of fluid between lens and cornea, and allows you to observe that you have apical clearance. 
any thinner than 20 microns, it might be hard to pick it up and you might think you have a lens in touch with the central cornea. Now, once you've got that apical clearance at an appropriate level, that allows the lens to land down in the mid periphery and be laterally stable. So what we want to see along the flat meridian is for the lens to touch down at three o'clock and at nine o'clock. So the contact lens is laterally stable. It's sitting on those two points and it is resistant um, from moving nasal or temporal. So this is good. We've got a few things that we want. The diameter right, the apical clearance correct. We've got landing at three and nine o'clock to create good stability. Now we want to assess the steep meridian. And what amount of fluid do we create along that steep axis of the lens? So let's click our cursor up top. We have 12 microns. Let's click our cursor down below at the optic zone junction. We have 38 microns. If you add the two of those together, you've got 50 microns of, of fluid if you average the what's at the top and what's at the bottom. Ideally, you want to stay around 20 microns of fluid at 12 and 6 o'clock at the optic zone junction. That's here and here. When you're greater than 20 microns, that gives the contact lens a little more room to rock back and forth. So this toric lens may not be toric enough for the eye. And this is what the MedMont does, is it helps us to determine what is the right lens to cornea relationship before we begin. Now I'm kind of a dumb guy. Let, let's assume that I'm just gonna fit this lens and assume that uh, it's just a little bit more fluid than we want. Uh, it, it shouldn't really affect the fit that much. Well, just to show you how accurate the MedMon is, uh, that's not a lot of fluid, 12 microns up top, 38 microns below, but you can see that this contact lens is a little bit sloppy vertically, that we have a little bit of a channel for that lens to rock back and forth. By designing the lens appropriately so we have less fluid, less uh, room for that lens to be tilting back and forth, especially with all the, the lid interaction, that uh, lower lid, uh, pardon me, that upper lid that crosses much of the upper iris, it's going to move the contact lens around a fair bit. So you hopefully get the sense of, of how valuable this tool can be in assisting us with our uh, lens, our specialty contact lenses. For instance, our baseline topographies, our pre-fitting topographies told us that our previous contact lens might be on the flat side. Our tangential map said that we can see the rings of where the lens lands and it's definitely high. The elevation map is telling us that we have a relatively toric peripheral cornea. Our contact lens software is telling us where to begin and also pushing us to modify the parameters so that we have less fluid running through the vertical. And with our new Meridia, now we have a tool to image and video these fits so that we can send them off to the consultant so they can assist us to modify this lens, to create a little more tericity along the steep meridian so we can slow down the movement of that contact lens, so we can stabilize it, create a, a very comfortable fit for this patient. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about dry eye. Now, he, we've known for many years now that a placido topographer can reflect off the tear film and give us a sense of the tear film quality. And you'll notice here, as we wait between blinks, those ring reflect, the ring reflection and the nature of the, the uh, parallel uh, reflection of the rings shows us that we're getting increasing distortion over time. And that's just telling us that we're getting tear film breakup. The longer we hold our eye open, uh, the more destabilized the tear film becomes. And that's evident, especially in the center here, where a lot of those rings in the center and inferior of the cornea appear to really distort. So a placido topographer can be a way that we can measure the tear film surface quality and the tear film breakup. And the MedMon is one of those instruments that'll do that. Using the tear film surface quality dry eye test, you're able to monitor the fluid 
a layer over a series of seconds, in this case about 15 seconds, to get a sense of uh, not only what is the quality of the tear film, but at what point does it break up? When do you get a, uh, sorry, at what time do you get a tear film breakup? So here we're able to see without any dye, without any invasive method, that our average surface area, tear film surface quality score is about 0.4. It's a little bit on the high side. We can see that 35% of the surface area is in breakup. We can see that we have a tear film breakup time at 2.8 seconds. And that last one is the big one. At what point do we get the tear film breakup time? So your Medmont Meridia that is used for topography used for contact lens disease assessment um, can also be used in your dry eye practice. And, and that's just one of the many things that the new instrument will, will do. Well, have a look at the patient side of the instrument. For those of you who've used the Medmont in the past, the Medmont E300, you're familiar with the appearance of the cone and the rings that reflect off the cornea. But here you might notice some new additions in the Meridia where you have three lights on either side of the cone. And basically what they do is they will provide the illumination for your mimography imaging, your infrared imaging, your white light anterior segment imaging, and your fluorescein, your cobalt uh, capture. In addition to, of course, your corneal topography. Now you'll notice that you've got lights on both sides. And this is a very important thing because you'll find when um, we show you some of the images that the Meridia does, you get a beautiful illumination of the entire field by having the lights where they are and having them diffused in the manner that they are. So here's an anterior segment image that we took with the uh, white light photography of your Meridia. And one of the things you'll notice is uh, the size of the field. We have this incredible field of view. Uh, so that gives us the opportunity to image quite a lot of the, both the, um, you know, ocular anatomy, but also uh, lid margins and, and beyond. You'll notice that the depth of field is really quite impressive. And um, that's also to do with the quality of the camera that Medmont has put into this new unit. It takes ultra high resolution, awesome images. And another thing that I, I don't think I picked up on immediately, but uh, some of my colleagues pointed out to me, was that uh, when you compare the illumination relative to the slit lamp, having those light sources on either side really gives you this broad, beautiful uh, illumination of the entire anterior segment. So it's really an impressive camera. Then for understanding other areas of the uh, the ocular anatomy as, for instance, looking at uh, the conjunctival redness, looking at the fitting of the edge of our scleral lenses as an example. We have a tool that does really beautiful uh, imaging um, as well as lid margin, lid disease, uh, any kind of uh, issues that we see on uh, lashes or beyond. So, uh, man, we've got this tool that does this beautiful high resolution photography and, and illuminate it in really an optimal way. You can also do uh, video and that allows us to document some of the fittings of our specialty uh, or regular contact lenses. And um, you can define how long you want that video to be. You can define the resolution that you want the video to be. So Medmont's really given us lots of options. For instance, for those of us who do a lot of education, lecturing, um, anytime you're trying to build uh, PowerPoints, you've got a tool now that will capture all of that imaging and, and export it so that we can uh, put it right into our PowerPoint, which is kind of nice. Then uh, for those of you who are very involved in specialty contact lenses and rigid lenses and ortho K, for an example, you also have a tool that will provide a very, very high resolution image of your contact lens fits, both as a single image, but also as a video. And the resolution is such that you're able to pick up a staining, you're able to pick up junk behind the lens, junk on the lens, as you can see in this case, um, it's a, uh, a, a beautiful image of a lot going on in this particular case, not, 
not just a ortho K lens that might be a little on the high side, but uh, some other things going on underneath that reservoir. And then of course, for your scleral lenses, you're able to image 100% of the scleral lens if it's uh, you know, under a, a, a 20 millimeter diameter. So we're able to really document a lot of our specialty contact lenses, which is super important when you think about um, how we work with the lab and, and having the ability to send this information to the lab so that they can help us when the fit isn't quite right. This becomes a pretty valuable uh, piece that uh, Meridia provides. Now you might make out in this image how I really messed up here and I got a foreign body underneath this contact lens prior to application and you see how easily the Meridia picks up those track marks from uh, that foreign body and it does a really good job of picking up uh, staining. Now I would never suggest to you that a uh, Meridia is, as, is equal to a slit lamp, but if you don't need that ultra high 40 mag, uh, if you're not needing to do an optic section, then this instrument does perform like a de facto slit lamp. And we've heard from many colleagues how I really don't need to take the patient to the slit lamp for some of my contact lens assessments. I can just I can just perform that analysis on the Meridia and I can document images and document with videos. So it's um, again, really quite an impressive imaging device. And again, kind of a de facto slit lamp in, in many respects. Now, another thing that Meridia can do is a, uh, an infrared uh, illumination and give us perspective on the uh, mybomian glands. So the mybography with the, um, with the Meridia is uh, really quite an impressive tool when coupled with that high resolution camera and the software that allows us to uh, highlight the individual glands themselves. We can also, with all this imaging, do tear meniscus height. So for anybody in the dry eye realm that's very focused in this area or desiring to be um, in dry eye practice, in this one tool, you have a ability to perform many different tests, uh, making you efficient, um, taking you one place to get all of this analysis and, and imagery. So I think that's a, a really important uh, understanding of, of this tool that, uh, yes, it's an instrument, but really what this is, is a device that allows you to access, well, first to image and then to access many different forms of analyses so that you can decide on a path for a patient in a very efficient manner. You know, this is one software, this is one place to go for all of your imaging and all of your analysis. So a really, really awesome tool where uh, I've always been happy that the MedMont was such a great corneal topographer that I could use it for all of my specialty contact lens fits but now I'm able to image all of those fits as well. And for those that are very focused in dry eye practice, again, you have uh, a whole, uh, whole slew of things that you can do in this one place. Well, let's go through one more case that uh, I thought might be fun. Uh, you know, here today, a corneal topographer is purchased uh, in a high percentage of cases for myopia control practice today. So, let's talk about a myopia control case. And you know, here's one where using the composite topography, we're able to get so much of the anterior segment of the cornea. Um, we're able to build that huge 11 millimeter ortho K lens. And um, being able to get data that far out is sure is helpful when you're trying to determine what is the tericity that my lens needs? What's the, the depth in the flat and steep meridian? In other words, what's the tericity we need? So having these large surface areas of capture becomes really important. Now, this particular patient was a uh, soft lens wearer that was having some trouble with their soft contact lenses, a little bit of, excuse me, dry eye uh, symptoms and looking for an alternative. So we thought maybe a ortho K might be appropriate and we might take our corneal topography and what would we assess now? This is a patient that's an adult, but um, let's assume if this were myopia control in kids, all these assessments that we're doing exactly the same, whether it's uh, for an adult or a, um, a child. 
Now, what are we looking at? Again, let's go to the K readings. We're all so comfortable with Ks. And here we see a very median cornea, 43.65 is a flat K. That means it's a pretty good candidate. Uh, generally, the flatter corneas can be a little bit more challenging in ortho K when you've got a high Rx. We see a very small amount of corneal astigmatism, only one diopter, so that certainly makes this a good candidate for ortho K. We look at the eccentricity and we have a slightly lower than average E value. 0.65 is the normal eccentricity with the Medmont. This patient's a little lower. We know that once the cornea spherically, once the cornea achieves zero eccentricity, there's very little room to create more effect. In other words, the higher the eccentricity in ortho K, uh, prior to ortho K, the better. Um, so if your patient has a lower E value, that might reduce the candidacy. Now, what else could we look at? Uh, we might look at the pupil size and we'd say in an adult, the smaller the pupil, the better because then we'll have less aberrations. For kids, the larger the pupil, the better because we want the eye to be subject to as, as much aberration as we can. That's what appears to be one of the signals that slows down that eye growth. We could look at the sagittal differential. Now, what is that value? That's looking at the height of the cornea around this periphery to say how toric is the outside of the eye. Not so much the center, what's the K readings or what's the corneal sill, but how toric does the landing of my ortho K lens need to be. So that's what the sagittal differential provides. When you have 30 microns or greater, that's typically where a toric lens will perform better than a symmetric. Now let's put a lens on eye. Let's use the Medmont contact lens software and build an ortho K lens. And here we see on the flat meridian, the ideal relationship. In the center, our contact lens is above the corneal surface, less than 10 microns of fluid between lens and cornea, really ideal. Now in the reservoir, this ring of fluorescein here, we see the fluid layer ramping up, an increased fluid thickness. That creates the suction force that pulls on the epithelium toward the, the periphery that contributes to giving us that myopic, sh that reduction in myopia that we desire. Now, the all important and what I would argue the most important part of an ortho K lens is the landing. If we get this right, we have a good chance of getting the centration correct. We have a good chance of having comfort and having the appropriate response. So here we see this beautiful landing at uh, eight, sorry, 9.30 and 3.30, and that's seen here and here. So things are looking really good on the flat meridian. On the steep meridian, you'll notice that our alignment zone is a mile off the cornea. The, the tissue, sorry, the fluid layer is getting thicker and thicker and thicker as you go away from center. We have not built uh, enough tericity into this lens to match the tericity of the eye. Now remember, this was a patient with one diopter of corneal astigmatism, not very much. So you would presume that a, a symmetric landing lens would be appropriate. But here we have a symmetric landing lens and you see the alignment zone is hanging off the eye surface. And that's where the sagittal differential told us the direction that we probably had to go. Remember it was 31 microns and that would suggest that anything 30 or greater, we should be using a toric landing. So by going to a symmetric, we may doom this patient to a lens that might not want to center, that might not be as comfortable as we want it, that might not produce the hydraulic force that we want. So again, the, the MedMod is a tool that really helps us in our decision-making process. Uh, what I should be doing now is reconstructing the lens for a toric landing so that we create a better relationship of this section of the lens. So we land at six o'clock, we land at 12 o'clock, we create 360 degrees of alignment with the cornea. Now, can you imagine if we would have fit this lens to the patient, what would be the outcome? That we're likely to see a lens that decenters. So we've 
maybe wasted the dispensing visit, assuming that eh, maybe in the closed eye environment it would work, and then we waste the patient's post-treatment visit um, only to find out that the lens didn't work and we should have trusted the topography and reconstructed, ordered the right first lens. So just to show you again what a dumb guy I am, I, I'm going to put this lens on anyway and let's see what happens. And you notice in, um, in primary gaze we get this, this lens that wants to ride high, that there, the lid might be influencing the position of the lens but it, it definitely is showing that there's nothing keeping it from uh, wanting to position superior. Now, if we were to open the lids up and try to get a sense of what is the pattern when the lens isn't so influenced by the lens, uh, by, uh, by the lids, I'm sorry. This is something my colleagues at the university remind me of all the time that you really need to understand what is the pattern of a rigid lens in a centered position. So whether you manipulate the position with the upper or lower lids, figure out where the, uh, or figure out what the pattern looks like when the lens is on center. Now, what do you see here? Of course, we've got a lens that we think clears the corneal apex. We can't see foreseen under the center, pretty typical of an ortho K lens. We see this arcuate landing at nine o'clock and three o'clock, that's great. Maybe a little more edge lift than we'd like on the nasal side, a little wider than we'd prefer. Not looking pretty optimal on the temporal side, but at 12 and six o'clock, there's a bit of a channel. There's some depth underneath that alignment zone where we really want that lens to align 360 degrees around. So this is one of the things that the Meridia is going to really help us to do is avoid going down a path where we're going to start with the wrong lens. And if we can avoid doing that on how many patients a month, imagine the chair time and the money we're going to save by choosing the right first lens a higher percentage of the time. Now, I use both of these cases, the conventional GP and this ortho K lens, um, to show you how subtle a difference it, just a few microns can make. Remember, this is a, an eye that had a 31 micron difference between the flat and the steep. This is an eye that had a one diopter difference between the flat and steep meridian in, um, in their K readings. Not a very astigmatic eye, but you, you can get the sense of how much an improvement we can make by thinking about microns, by using the tool to best align this lens in both meridians. Now, what happened with this fit? And here's the outcome. This was just one night, uh, clearly not going in the right direction. You notice the blue treatment zone on your axial map uh, appears to maybe be a little bit high, but it's this hot spot in here that we're just not pushing out of the way. And I'm going to presume that that's the fact that the lens can rock back and forth too much and it's not likely to squeeze that out of the way. Now, although this was short term wear, we really need to go longer to prove out whether this lens can achieve full effect. Remember, for those of you who don't do a lot of ortho K, full effect is seven to 10 days. So rushing to conclusions after one day might not be the thing to do. But I'm thinking based on the floor scene pattern and how the lens appears to want to be high, the lens didn't appear to align 360 degrees around. We'd have this meridian where it could rock and our topography after one night is showing us kind of a tilted effect, a little more treatment up top versus down below. Maybe I want to consider refitting. Now here's the tangential map. And remember the tangential is used to understand the position of the lens in the closed eye environment. And here you're looking at the red rings in the center, the blue rings around it to understand where are the zones of my ortho K lens and what effects are they creating on the corneal epithelium. And I think our lens is centering reasonably well based on those rings, but I don't know that we're gonna create the effect. And the axial map is, is saying that you're not producing a very even effect. Now again, guys, this is only one night. We shouldn't rush to conclusions, but I wanted to share this case because 
it was just kind of cool. It's a very low corneal astigmat. And, and one diopter, or for those of you who think in millimeters, 0.2 millimeters of corneal sill, that's not a patient you would think you need a toric lens, but the, the Meridia is telling us in that floor scene pattern that we could probably benefit from a toric landing lens. Now, one of the issues for any new orthokeratologist or any practitioner who's uh, new to a specific type of rigid lens, maybe this is a product that you've got from your lab that's brand new to you. You don't know all the nuances of this uh, optic zone, the edge, the diameters, base curves, all the various things that you can modify. It's awful nice to use the experts at the lab. And, and this might be one of the most beneficial things that a a MedMont allows you to do, you can highlight all of that imagery you took. In this case, I have my baseline topography, my post-treatment topography, my fluorescein images and video. I just highlight them all and click export. And that creates this little file that en encapsulates all of that information, all of that digital data. And that can be emailed or sent to the lab and they can import the topographies and the images into their MedMont software. That means that they're able to do the analysis and assessment as if they had taken the topography themselves. They have all the digital data. So that gives your consultant at the lab a very complete understanding of what's happening and therefore what needs to be modified. What do we do next? So hopefully this first session has, has made some sense that you've got a, a tool now that's so much more than just a topographer. This is one instrument that allows so many different analyses to go into the same place and be held. So I go into one patient file and I get the topography. I get the white light analysis. I get the fluorescein, cobalt analysis, mybography, the tear film surface quality analysis, lid margin assessment, uh, conjunctival whiteness. I mean, the, the list of, of um, imaging that we can do is, is broad. And I'm only going to one place in the software. So instead of having many different instruments needing to teach the technicians numerous tools, numerous software, needing to maintain numerous software platforms and computers and such. We have one computer, one instrument, one place in the practice that we can go for many of our, our um, analyses options. And that, of course, will create more efficiency. And, and you might argue it's going to save a lot of uh, the space in your practice as well. Now, one of the things that we didn't really go over was some of the new features related to dry eye, and that's the ability to uh, look at grading scales for the various dry eye indicators. And what you can do then is say, all right, I think that I've got a, uh, a staining scale of two on this particular eye, so I'm going to select that with the uh, marker here then I can go to the various other dry eye indicators. I can quickly and efficiently select where this patient stands based on these grading scales. And that all will go into a dry eye report that's very quickly and efficiently created. So now you have a tool to present to the patient, to print out or send to them, email to them, however you want to do that. And they're able to get some perspective on why you are recommending the treatment that you are and why they need to be committed to that treatment. So a very uh, it, a beautiful a tool that's been added to this Meridia that uh, makes this so much more than just a corneal topography tool. For me, I'm, I'm much more of a contact lens guy. I love the imaging and video in this instrument. The high resolution camera on this thing is awesome. And its ability to, uh, to help me uh, build lectures as an example and, uh, and document uh, cases is really something I appreciate. So um, for those of you who are kind of geeks about photography, I, I think you'll really like this ability to, um, to take some really high res images. And as we said, this new topographer does a lot of things for the practice. One instrument in one place in the practice, giving us all kinds of information. And then of course it can be networked throughout the practice. So uh, any number of exam rooms can have access to all of your information from your, 
your Meridia topographer, which uh, makes it quite a tool. So we have a lot we can do with the, the new Meridia and this, the fact that it's still a great corneal topographer is exceptionally meaningful to me. I, I, I'm a topography geek. I want good data. I don't want to start with the wrong first lens. If we can have a high first fit success, then that helps us be so much more efficient, makes the experience for the patient so much better. Uh, our ability to do all this imaging um, now that we could, couldn't do previously and in a manner that gives us such a clear and precise understanding of what's going on, the, the illumination of the entire field, the size of the field, the depth of the field. It's, um, I, I know I, I'm sounding like quite the disciple, but I really do love our Meridia topographer and I'm, I'm not wanting to give it up. So if you want some more information uh, prior to our next session, um, you can go to medmont.com. There's uh, a brand new site built for the understanding of this new uh, Medmont Meridia tool. Um, John's gonna go through uh, some thoughts about what's upcoming. And I, I just wanted to say, I hope that you enjoyed the session. And um, for those of you who are more advanced in your application of corneal topography, the next session, I hope that we can show some of the additional tools that we can do for your specialty contact lenses and your uh, various complicated cases. So that will be in session two uh, next week.